getting into the political history of the Maurya dynasty. We have already said that the foundation of the Mauryan dynasty was made by Chandragupta Maurya. The Mauryan rule came by displacing the erstwhile rulers of Magadh, namely the Nanda dynasty, which itself was a very mighty power. The beginning of the Maurya rule, as we have said, is sometime between 325 BC and 321 BC. We do not know the exact date. One thing is clear that the Maurya rule was established in Magadh with its capital at Pataliputra. Before we embark on describing the political history, including the foundation of the Maurya rule, a few preliminary words are necessary. There is, in fact, a long history of Magadh even before the Mauryas came into prominence. Magadh, that is the region of present-day southern part of Bihar, was one of the 16 territorial polities called Mahajanapadas during the time of the Buddha. In the beginning, it was just one of the 16 political powers. Then it began to rise fast under two very energetic rulers, Bimbisara and Ajatashatru in the 6th, 5th centuries BC. There were then many rulers, but it was possibly by the early part of the 4th century BC that the Nandas came to occupy power in Magadh. By the time its most important uh, city was Pataliputra, which we have already said, figures in Greek accounts as Palibotra, even at the time of Alexander's invasion in India. The rise of Magadha had already become visible under the very powerful Nanda king Mahapadma Nanda, who actually flourished before the Mauryas. This energetic ruler, a very well-known conqueror, established Magadhan control over a vast tract of North Indian plains. We are not getting into that. The last known ruler of the Nanda dynasty was Dhanananda, known in the Greek texts as Zandrims or Agrammes. We do not know exactly how Chandragupta Maurya came to displace the last Nanda ruler Dhananda. We shall come to that later. But we would also like to ponder here the very dynastic name Maurya, where from this name crop up. The name Maurya is explained by historians in different way by using different types of texts. One version is following the drama Mudra Rakshasha that Chandragupta originally was a son of a Nanda ruler, his mother was a slave woman named Mura of the Nanda rule. She belonged to the Nanda household and was a slave woman and the name Mura actually is the base of the name ending of the first ruler Maurya. As we said, this is a late story and we cannot really put much faith on that. The other story figuring in a Jaina text is that the, num, the name Maurya actually is derived from the term Moyura, peacock, because Chandragupta Maurya's early life was spent among a peacock tamer's clan, Moyura Poshaka. And from there, from Mo, Moyura, the term Maurya is derived according to this story. Once again, this is a late story. The Greek rulers tell us that the ruler named Sandrocortus did not have any pedigree. He did not belong to a royal house. He did not enjoy a high 
bodna status that is typical of a ruler of Kshatriya origin. So there is, even though the stories are different and the stories be belong to different periods, one thread, common thread is visible, that Chandragupta Maurya did not enjoy any pedigree. He did not belong to a Kshatriya family. Perhaps he came from a relatively obscure origin. The later Buddhist Silonis texts considered that the Mauryas were Kshatriyas, possibly trying to highlight that the Mauryas belong to a high Varna origin, which is debatable. Once again, if we go look at the Greek texts, the stories are, particularly in the stories of Justin and Plutarch, that Sandrakottas, without any, having any pedigree, was asleep in a deep forest when a lion licked his feet. There is also a story that an elephant picked him up of his own accord on the trunk and kept it, kept him on his head. Now once again there are commonalities in the story that association of the first Maurya ruler with forest region, that the Maurya ruler did not enjoy a pedigree and from a relatively obscure origin he rose to immense political prominence. As we said these are all later sources. There is however one very early text. This is the Mahaparinibbana Suttanta, a canonical Buddhist text that speaks of a clan, a non-monarchical clan named the Mauryas, the Mauryas of Pippalivana. This Pippalivana area is located in the Nepali Starai area. The name Maurya comes very close to the well-known later historical name the Mauryas. And this is the earliest of the literary sources we are using. So this much is clear that Chandragupta Maurya rose to prominence without ever enjoying a royal pedigree or a very high social status in his early life. Without going into the other legends and stories, this much is clear that Chandragupta Maurya overthrew the last Nanda ruler Dhananda or Agrames Zandrims and captured power at Pataliputra. By doing so, possibly in around 325 or maybe around 321 BC, he soon inherited the already extensive territorial position under the Nanda rule of Magad. The Greek authors, particularly Plutarch and Justin, referred to a major clash between Chandragupta Maurya and the last known Greek governors who were placed in charge by Alexander at the time of his departure from India. These Greek governors were placed in charge of different areas of present day Punjab and in the northwest. According to the description of Justin, Sandrakottas, that is Chandragupta, put an end to the last remnants of the existence of the Greek governors. The last known date of the existence of Greek governors is about 316, 317 BC. So if Chandragupta Maurya captured power in Magadh by about 324, 321 BC, then in the next six or seven years, he was gradually pushing his territories from the Ganga Valley towards the Punjab area that is not northwest and therefore came into clash with the Greek governors established by Alexander at the time of his departures. So there is a clear expansion of the territory from the Ganga Valley area towards the north and northwest. It obviously came close to the northwestern frontier of the subcontinent. At that time, the northwestern frontier area also bordered close to 
the realm of Seleucus Nicator, a general of Alexander. As we know well, Alexander did not leave any direct successors to his vast territorial conquered area. So after his death, his conquered area was apportioned among his generals. The eastern part of his territorial possessions came under the authority of his one of his generals, Seleucus Nicator. Seleucus Nicator was ruling over West Asia and also the area came close to the northwestern borderland of the subcontinent. That led to the clash between Chandragupta Maurya and Seleucus Nicator around 301 BC. We do not know the exact account of the war, nor do we know about the exact outcomes of this conflict. I must tell very clearly here that there is no indication whatsoever that Chandragupta and Seleucus entered into an actual marriage alliance or Seleucus gave his daughter to Chandragupta Maurya as a mark of this peace treaty. No less significant is the fact that the first known international treaty in Indian history took place at the time of Chandragupta Maurya's reign. Did the Mauryas really control the three areas in the northwestern borderland of the subcontinent? In fact, these areas are outside the present boundary of the Indian Union. Yes, the Mauryas did. This is known, we shall discuss it later, from the inscriptions of Ashok found from regions close to Kabul, that is Lagman, Puli Darunta, and also close to Kandahar. And we know that Ashok did not conquer these areas. Yet Ashoka's rule over the areas now included in parts of Raj Afghanistan is quite clear. So, the inclusion of these areas within Mauryan realm goes back to the time of Chandragupta, who got these territories as a part of the treaty signed as a result of his conflict with Seleucus Nicator. So, we once again see how the Mauryan political authority expanded from its principal stronghold in Magadha, particularly also in Ganga Valley, then into the Punjab, Punjab to the northwestern frontier areas, and then beyond the northwestern frontier areas to certain areas of present day Afghanistan. The inscriptions of Ashok coming from Afghanistan are written in Greek and Aramaic script and languages. We have also to keep in mind that Chandragupta Mauryas rule over western part of India, the present area of Kathiawar, Junagar region, is also known to us in the form of a later epigraphic document, an inscription of 150 AD 
belonging to the Shaka ruler Rudradaman remembers very clearly the rule of Chandragupta Maurya and also the provincial authority who ruled in this region on behalf of Chandragupta Maurya. The Mauryas ruled over a very large area covering almost greater parts of the Indian subcontinent except the far south and the far northeast. Now Ashok conquered only Kalinga. As I said before, his father Bindusara is not known in historical sources as a great conqueror. So if you take out the conquest of Kalinga, the rest of the vast territorial position of the Mauryan dynasty actually goes back to the time of Chandragupta Maurya. We really do not know how he conquered certain areas in the peninsular part of India. But take for example in later Tamil literary texts, there is some memory of the Moyuria presence in the south. The Mauryas are considered the Bamba Maurya, the Maurya upstart ruler. It is also significant to note that Chandragupta Maurya, according to Jaina tradition, breathed his last in Shravanavelgula in Karnataka. This possibly may suggest some association of Chandragupta Maurya with the peninsular part. We do not know very clearly the last days of Chandragupta Maurya. We exactly do not also know how long did he rule because there is no clear inscriptional evidence during his reign. He did not issue any inscriptions. It appears that a quarter of a century of rule of Chandragupta Maurya is in order. So if he ascended the throne around 325 BC, then his reign is likely to have ended around the end of the 4th century BC by about 300 BC. We cannot uh, determine the veracity of this story very in an authentic manner, but at least this is the story of the last days of Chandragupta Maurya's life in the Jaina literature. He is remembered in the Jaina literature as a devout Jaina, particularly in the last phase of his life. Chandragupta Maurya is known from the Greek accounts of Megasthenes. As we said, Megasthenes' Indica, which is handed down to us by the later three accounts of Diodorus, Strabo and Arian, speaks of many aspects of administrative system of the Mauryan times, social and economic conditions of the Mauryan times, the network of communications of the Mauryan times, which we shall discuss in details later. But there is absolutely no doubt that the treaty with Seleucus resulted in the arrival of Megasthenes as a Seleucidian envoy to the Mauryan court, Pataliputra. There are some problems in the descriptions of Megasthenes. He has given us many fantastic stories like he once said in his account that Indians are never accused of lying. Definitely this is a hyperbolic statement. Or he said, famine never visited in India. This is also a hyperbolic statement. But after all, 
his impressions, sometimes bordering on fantasy, sometimes definitely inaccurate. After all, his impressions emerge out of an eyewitness account. He did visit India. He was mainly based in Arakosi or Kandahar area. And from Kandahar, he visited Pataliputra, Palibotra, the Mauryan capital. Obviously, he traversed a greater part of the subcontinent, particularly northern Indian areas. After Chandragupta's reign came to the throne, his son and successor, Bindusara. Once again, we do not have any definite dates about this second ruler of the Mauryan dynasty. We have to assume, in the absence of any farm data, that Bindusara also ruled for about 25, 27 or 26 years. So if he came to ascend the throne around 300 BC, he possibly ruled up to 275-273 BC. This rule of 25 or 27 years is once again known from different sources, none of which really is a contemporary source. He did not issue any inscriptions or there is no definitely ascribable coins belonging to his reign. From the different sources available to us, at least this much is clear that Bindusara was able to more or less retain intact the territorial position what he inherited from Chandragupta Maurya. This is no mean an achievement. Already the Mauryan realm is quite extensive. At least there is no known historical record that speaks of any shrinkage of the size of the Mauryan realm during his time. He's, that's why we think that he was able to retain intact what he inherited from Chandragupta Maurya. There is at least one Buddhist story in the Divyavadana, of course a later text, that speaks of his rule, continued Maurya rule over Taxila, Takshashila area. The context is a bit different. The Divyavadana story says that there was popular discontent at the nature of Mauryan ruling at Taxila, people were discontent. Having heard that, Bindusara is said to have sent Ashoka to get information about the discontent and to pacify the subjects. Ashoka did go there and learned that the local population had no misgivings about the Maurya ruler, but they were definitely against the administrators, Amatyas of the Mauryan realm. At least this story tells us, gives an impression that Bindusara was able to retain the northwestern frontier area during his reign. What is interesting emerges from Greek sources. In the Greek sources, Bindusara is named as Amitrochatis or Alitrochatis. This Greek name is in fact derived from the Indian name or Sanskritic name Amitraghata, meaning a ruler who is a slayer of his enemies, a slayer of his foes. This epithet may indicate the prowess of Bimbisara, though as we said earlier, we have no clear evidence if he at all undertook any major conquest. Whom he actually slayed, we, did not, we do not know. The Greek texts remember him as a close friend of the Syrian Greek ruler Antiochus I. According to the Greek accounts, our Bindusara requested to Antiochus I 
to buy for him figs, good wine, and a philosopher. The Greek term for philosopher is the sophist. Antiochus the first is said to have replied that he would be happy to send for his Indian counterpart fig and wine, but not the philosopher, because the sophist or the philosopher cannot be purchased. He is not a purchasable commodity. Once again, what is emerging out of this Greek account is Bindusara's continuation of the Mauryan policy of maintaining cordial relation with the Greek rulers beyond the northwestern borderland of the subcontinent, in this case Antiochus I. This is a policy the Mauryas have begun during the time of Chandragupta Maurya in the form of entering into an, a treaty into an alliance with Seleucus Nicator. So, the Maurya ruler Bindusara continues this policy, one may call it in fact some kind of a policy to maintain amiable relation with rulers beyond his realm. I am by no means trying to tell that what is called foreign policy now in present day is anticipated by the Mauryas, but there is a sustained interest of the Mauryas to keep a friendly relation with the Greek rulers of West Asia. This will be a policy we shall see later continued also by Ashoka.